Strange tales told be a Dubliner, be Torloch con me. Story number seven. The Roman Burial Ground. The fortunes of Panadutes as a one industry town were for a long time mixed up with the fortunes of Hans Widmer, as I came to appreciate when I went to the Swiss Alpine village in the Grison to work there in the 1990s. Everyone knew a certain amount about Widmer's past. You could say he was a go-getter. He had been a number of years out in West Africa as the manager of a cola factory. Then he came back to Switzerland. Through his connections, he was appointed by the owners of an American company, Nevada Electronics, to set up a branch plant for them in Switzerland. Widmer prospected for a village or town in the Grison that would give Nevada an attractive deal on tax, and he found it in Panadouts. Now, Panadouts was just a village, a rather modern one since a village fire had just about razed all the old buildings in 1908. It seems it started with two little boys playing with matches in a barn. In them days, when a fire started in a village, it usually spread rapidly and ended up burning the whole place down by the time the fire brigade with its horse-drawn tenders reached the scene from the nearest town or city. Anyway, the town council was hoping to attract an industry to Panadouts, because as it was, they had none, and so they made Vidmar and the Americans a winning offer. When Nevada Panadouts AG, as the company was called, set up operations on the edge of the village, it was in a few prefabs at first. Vidmar and his staff went for lunch each day to the local restaurant. This was in the late 1960s. The firm prospered in tandem with its American head office and by the time I arrived there to work in the 1990s it consisted of two linked modern buildings made of glass and concrete. Panadouts was a fairly modern looking village as I have said but the factory seemed to me a very alien presence when I arrived there all the same. It looked to me like a huge spacecraft that happened to have landed on the edge of a Swiss village. The first time I met Hans Widmer, I was able to take the measure of the man fairly quickly. He was a grizzled-looking man in his late fifties, and although he smiled affably, one could tell that here was a tough character who was used to getting his way against any opposition. Rather than weighing matters carefully, I dare say he made up his mind about everything quickly and unhesitatingly, and you were not likely to change his mind. I could tell that he didn't think much of the locals, although it was obvious too that they made up much of the factory workforce. There were men from Panadouts itself, or the neighbouring village of Ratsen, or from the mountain hamlets on both sides of the valley. It was just the human material he had to work with. He gestured to the landscape outside his spacious office window, which looked southwards. You could see the Alps on either side, framing the valley on the way down to the Via Mala, the road to Italy. He said that people from around here tended to be Hinterweltler, that is, backwoodsmen. Yet the partnership seemed to work. The factory staff seemed to function well enough, and the few high-tech and management positions were filled by Swiss from the cities, or by Germans, who had to adapt to the ways of the majority rather than the other way around. It struck me that he must consider the locals here in the valley in the same perspective he considered the factory workers in West Africa, by all accounts. Excitable, superstitious natives who needed to be firmly brought into the 20th century. Whatever his attitude to the locals, Widmer was clearly an important citizen now in the village, 
perhaps the most important, and as such he felt entitled to build himself a house in a representative location. There were pieces of land on offer on top of the Botvalbeuna, a steep hill of which there were several to be seen in the valley. Panaduts is on the floor of an elevated alpine valley stretching southwards. Towered in Alps enclose it on both sides. The valley is fairly flat, but a feature of the landscape here is the bot, which is a Romance word for a humpbacked hill. These bots just seem to rise over the flat landscape. Presumably they're a natural feature. But in some localities they're known by another word, tuma or tumba, which originally means tumulus, that is, a barrow or prehistoric grave mound. Obviously people imagined that these odd-looking hillocks or mounds were man-made at the dawn of history, with primitive workmen heaping them up and chieftains or the like being interred there. The Bot Valbeuna was such a hillock just outside the village. It rose about 300 feet above the surrounding farmland. I often looked across at it when going for a walk on the north side of the village. It was covered in trees and grasses, and for whatever reason, it appealed to crows. Any time you looked down at the field in front of it, or at the steep grassy slope of the bot itself, there would be numerous black crows flying about, cawing to one another, and settling on the ground or in trees. The bot Valbeuna had been used for grazing farm animals up to that time, and was otherwise uninhabited. I don't know, maybe Wittmer had quietly nudged the town council to rezone the area for housing, and they obliged him. Widmer bought a plot of land that was at the end of the sort of ridge forming the hill, and he hired contractors to commence laying the foundations for his house. In the meantime, two other well-to-do locals had bought the other pieces of land for housing, and a road was being put in. Yet, as often happens in Switzerland, whether rural or urban, no sooner had the workmen started digging than they came across something ancient. In this case, it was human bodies. They seemed to be all around. The archaeologists had to be called in, and all work stopped while they did a thorough excavation. It emerged that this hill must have been used for a burial ground in Roman times. The Romans had at one time occupied the Grison, or Raetia as they called it, and made their capital in Curia Raetorum, which was later known as the city of Cur. They conquered the barbarian tribe that had held immemorial sway there, the Raeti, and taught them Latin, so that they forgot their original language entirely. Over the centuries, this provincial vulgar Latin evolved, or degenerated, into the language now known as Romance. Panadutes must have been a village even in them days, when the legions marched northwards and southwards through Raetia. There's no record of there having been a village there in antiquity, but in view of its strategic location at the head of the High Valley, it wouldn't be at all surprising. When the archaeologists went to work, they didn't find anything in the way of buildings or other artefacts, just a few potsherds. But there was the human record. There were bodies. In fact, there were hundreds of bodies buried in this ancient site. Now some were oriented, that is, laid with their heads to the east, to Jerusalem, but most were not. This suggested that Panadutes had been converted to Christianity at some time, while the Roman burial ground was already in use. I remember seeing the pictures of the excavation in the local core paper. It was a sensational find. With the top layer of earth exposed, you could see hundreds of bodies, spaced wide apart, but arranged in ranks and files some with their bones and grinning skulls almost intact. They looked to me like sunbathers, 
lying on a holiday beach somewhere. Anyway, the archaeologists were able to establish that this burial ground could be dated from the 1st to the 3rd century AD, possibly even earlier. But the land had now been sold for housing, so what were they to do? They spent several months documenting the bodies and their positions in the burial ground. They salvaged a few artefacts they found, like pot shards, and then they sealed up the ground again so that building could start afresh. Widmer's house was the first to be completed, and he and his family moved in. They seemed to be pleased to be there. The only thing was, he mentioned to people that whenever he got up in the middle of the night and went through the darkened hall and rooms, he seemed to encounter other people, shadowy people, sometimes muttering together, though he couldn't understand anything they were saying. His assumption was that he was still half dreaming and fancied he saw people from his crowded waking life here in his new house. They were certainly not burglars or anything like that, for they just stood around in groups and muttered to one another, like guests at a party. They completely ignored him or other family members who saw them. They were insubstantial too. Whenever he moved towards them, they seemed to fade away into nothingness. When he turned the light switch on, there was no one in the brightened room but himself. He thought he must be having hallucinations or some sort of night dream. Maybe he was overworking. He resolved to take the family for a skiing holiday in St Moritz. As time went by, Widmer began to see the mysterious figures outside the house. They'd be standing by a window or standing out in the garden. They were like guests at a party, out for a breath of late night air and a smoke. A few times he phoned the police about these unknown trespassers. But the police patrol found nothing when they came. Widmer felt like a fool and gave up calling. He just decided to ignore them until such time as the family and himself could go off for that skiing holiday he promised them. The shadowy people of Bot Valbeuna, whoever they were, now started to fan out from Widmer's house and tramp into the village itself. Villagers up late at night would look out their windows and see groups of these dark strangers walking around the streets and lanes with no clear aim in view. The numbers were difficult to estimate as the people walked close together in the darkness and seemed to merge into one another. The figures were all dark, dressed in dark cloaks, and many with hoods pulled down over their heads. Their bodies seemed thin and emaciated. They left no footprints. Their faces could hardly be glimpsed. The odd person who was out very late at night would meet groups of them on the streets. They'd be looking into houses and barns and muttered into one another. The parish priest was coming home from a sick call late one night and encountered such a group muttering amongst themselves. He averred that they were speaking Latin, though he couldn't quite follow what they said. This all aroused memories of the Toten folk, the procession of the dead that are supposed to march through villages in the dead of night and are sometimes seen out on the mountains too. Could this be such a phenomenon? It could. There were many stories about the Toten folk, the dead folk. They're supposed to be the ghosts of the dead on their way through familiar landscapes till they get to God knows where. Some say that the idea originated in pre-Christian times in the Alps, when the god Wotan was supposed to lead or drive the souls of the dead, a numberless host, through the snow of the mountains till they reached the other world. This notion from pagan times was replaced by heaven, hell and purgatory in the Christian era. Yet the idea of the Toten folk, the marching souls of the dead, lived on. And indeed, when you think of it, the idea of restless souls on a journey is not far from the idea of purgatory 
where the suffering souls undergo purification on their way to heaven. The Toten Falk were a known sight to those who were out late or up late at night in an Alpine village like Panatouts. You might see a group of shadowy people marching through the village or along a road and they might seem all strangers to you except that you start to recognise people towards the back of the column as relatives or neighbours. But they're people you realise with a sense of shock to be already years dead. Those making up the rear are the most recently deceased. Often there is a straggler at the back of the column. If you recognise him or her, it's sure to be a local person who has just died. If it's a doppelganger of yourself, it means you'll die shortly. One story tells of an old man in the village of Closters up in the Pretigau who woke up in the dead of night and heard people walking by. He was in such a hurry to investigate, he was pulling on his trousers as he opened the window onto the street. In fact, he only had one leg in his trousers and one still out. He looked down and what did he see? A large group of people talking in low voices as they walked through the village. At the back was a straggler. He seemed to be limping. The old man couldn't tell who he was. But as he walked by, he realised that this man was not really limping. In fact, he had one leg in his trousers and one out, and was trying to walk along after the others that way. A couple of weeks after he recounted this incident, the old man was dead. It seems the Toten Folk even appeared betimes in the city of Kur. In a story that dates from the 18th century, a woman had encountered them marching through the streets at night and recognised some of the recently deceased, whereat she crossed herself in pious horror. But the biggest surprise was the straggler she saw at the back. She recognised him as the Bishop of Kur. But how could this be? The Bishop was in good health and had just gone on a journey to the south of the Grison. Next day, she met a local priest and told him her story. He told her that news had just reached the cathedral canons that the bishop had died unexpectedly on his journey. At any rate, the nocturnal wanderers in Panadouts were quickly identified in people's minds with the Toten Folk. Superstitious dread sowed its seeds among the population. Villagers began to stay in at night. And this was not all. Some people reported activity in the parish church during the night. This old church was situated in the middle of the village, but a little way away from the main street, in a shadowy quiet place surrounded by trees. The church itself had a baroque altar, but it had medieval foundations, and at the back of the sanctuary you could see the fading traces of a medieval mural. So the Church of the Assumption, as it was called, went back a long way in the history of the village. Houses had since been built on the opposite side of the street to the apse of the church, and it was people in these houses who professed to notice mysterious goings-on in the church very late at night. There seemed to be candles burning in there, they said, and voices could be heard praying and chanting. No one ever felt like venturing over there to investigate, however. The parish priest lived in a house just down from the church, and if he saw or heard anything, he wasn't saying. All he would say was that when he or the sacristan opened the church first thing in the early morning, they found no trace of nighttime activity. <laughs> 
In the meantime, the range of the shadowy figures was expanding further in Panadouts. They seemed to be everywhere now. They began to be seen by the night shift at the Nevada factory. How they got in, no one could tell. But groups of them wandered about the factory floors and pointed to machinery, muttering incomprehensibly. After a while, local men started refusing to go in and work the night shift. This, of course, aroused Vidmer's ire. He felt confirmed in his judgment of the villagers as superstitious backwoodsmen. On the other hand, the villagers began to point the finger of blame at Vidmer. The connection had been made in local talk between the sensational finds of the archaeologists and the wandered in groups of strangers at night. Vidmer, people now said, had disturbed the burial ground with his grandiose project of building a house there, and the spirits of the unquiet dead were not only haunting him, who didn't care he was so hard-headed, but also the entire peaceful village. I got an earful of this when I sat at the regular's table at the Alte Post, as it did one particular evening. I remember Matthias Kaluri, an old man from the village, telling the assembled company, All this disturbance and fright in Panadouts at night is due to one thing, the Roman burial ground they opened. If they just sealed it up again and left those dead in peace, there would have been no trouble, God willing. But that troublemaker, Hans Widmer, was up on his high horse, and nothing would do him but to build himself a house on the burial ground. He has brought a curse on all of us. When he came to the village twenty-five years ago, I knew he would bring trouble. He was a stranger who didn't understand us and didn't care what we thought. He had no respect for the old ways. Now look at what he's done. A younger man whom I knew from working at Nevada tried to speak in Vidmer's defence. Look here, Matthias, he's not all that bad. He brought the factory to Panadouts. He brought hundreds of jobs. It's because of him that the village has prospered, and so many men don't have to move away to the cities because they have work here. He's a hard man, I know, but, but a good man too. That's as may be growled Matthias when the other man was finished. But Hans Widmer has ended up bringing enough trouble on Panadouts to compensate for the good things he's brought with his factory. What use is in a cursed village? How can people live here now? The crowds of ghosts wandering the streets will drive us all out sooner or later. If this was an accurate gauge of the mood of the village, it boded no good for Widmer. Something was bound to give. Now, Widmer himself was occasionally seen at the bar of Beeler's Hotel next door to the Alta Post. He would come in for a drink at the regular's table and meet people he knew, especially the hotelier Beeler and his family, and sometimes they'd play cards. So he heard the rumours and accusations that were flying around. But, as might be expected, Widmer impatiently scoffed them off. He said mass hysteria must be taken over the village. He accepted no blame for going ahead and building his new house on top of the Roman burial ground. He said the archaeologists had got what they wanted, the laws had been complied with, and there was nothing more to be said. He didn't believe in old superstitions and the fact that a lot of Romans or Ratians were buried under his house didn't bother him in the slightest. If other people wanted to be bothered, it was their own affair. Just don't bother him. As it happened, Vidmer seriously misjudged the mood of the village. He failed to take the matter seriously until it was out of hand. People were getting more and more bothered by the nightly sightings of the dead, for that was what all assumed they must be. One evening after dark, a noisy procession of villagers congregated on the square off the main street. Then they walked through the streets and out to the Bot Valbeona. The mood was ugly. There was hundreds of them, 
that were carrying flame and torches and were accompanied by barking dogs. They marched out onto the hilltop and went to Vidmer's gate. Vidmer was at home, relaxing after a day's work at his Nevada office. He was aroused by the commotion and came out to see the threatening crowd. What do you want? he called defiantly. You! Out! responded someone in the crowd. Vidmer out! called another. Vidmer out! Vidmer out! The crowd began to chant. Vidmer out! Vidmer out! And then one man shouted, You have opened the gates of hell in Panadudes! Realising now exactly what was on their minds, Vidmer shouted back, Nonsense! That's no more than superstition! There was an angry murmur from the crowd, and in response, several burning faggots were tossed in Vidmer's direction, setting bushes and hedges in the garden ablaze. Soon the porch and the house door caught fire too. Luckily Vidmer's wife had long since phoned the police. Panadutes had only one policeman, but he was on duty that night, and he promptly relayed the message to the cantonal police. So just at this point when things were out of hand, several cantonal police Land Rovers arrived, escorting a fire engine from a neighbouring town. The crowd gradually dispersed as the police cars drove through, lights flashing, and the firemen put out the blaze in the garden in front of the house. So what could have been a very nasty situation was avoided. Still, Vidmar had got the message, obviously. He moved himself and his family out of the house on the Bot Valbeuna and went to live in a rented house in Coor, about ten miles away. Thereafter, he just commuted from the city to Nevada Panadutes. Eventually he retired after 35 years at the helm in Nevada. Few in the factory seemed sorry to see him go. They just thought it was time for new blood and new ideas. There was no celebration or vote of thanks in the village, despite the fact that Nevada had made Panadutes more prosperous than it ever had been when it was an idyllic hamlet of farmers and woodcutters. In the meantime, Vidmar had bought himself a well-appointed house in Coeur. As for his house on the Bot Valbeuna, it was abandoned. According to rumours I heard, he tried to sell it, but found no buyers. It is very difficult to sell a house anywhere in Switzerland, especially in a remote area. But he wasn't able to rent it out either. It seems that word had got around. So it stood there, an empty shell. The only revenue he could make from it was allowing a local farmer to graze his sheep out there. The other two bits of land had their new purchasers withdraw. No more houses were ever built there. Most importantly, the lack of human presence out on the Bot Valbeona seemed to have the effect so much desired by the villagers. All that could be seen now, be day or night, was the sheep grazing peacefully on the grasses and among the trees, their little bells tinkling. They clearly trod lightly on the land. That was the end of the disturbance that had caused the villagers to fear what was out on the Bot Valbeona. No more crowds of shadowy figures emerged from the place to descend on the village at night. There were no totem folk abroad. There was no mysterious worship in the parish church at night. There were no shadowy shift workers at the factory during the hours before dawn. The ancient dead were content to remain on the Bot Valbeona where they lay. The Roman burial ground had returned to its thousand-year repose.
You have been listening to The Roman Burial Ground Be Torlock on Me from Strange Tales Told Be a Dubliner. If you enjoyed the story, don't forget to like, subscribe, share and comment. So until next time.